Amen. Just a few announcements before we start our service tonight. Uh, you may notice that the lights on this side of the church aren't really functioning. And so you might have thought it was a youth service and we were going to go with the fog machine and stuff. No, it's just an electrical problem. And uh, so we're not, we're not exactly sure what the deal is. But, uh, amen, if you, if you promise to stay awake, all you folks sitting over here kind of in the twilight there. <laughs> amen. I do just want to mention, I do want to mention that... Um, that coming up uh, this weekend on the 13th and 14th is Youth Retreat in Fredericton. So uh, we have a group of young people that are going to that, and we're looking forward to that. And we do covet your prayers as we travel to Fredericton and, uh, and home again. Um, we also want to mention that next Sunday is a special Sunday. We have the, uh, we have the Bible School students with us, and uh, we're looking forward to that. We've already got one of them here, just, just make, keeping an eye out, see if we want to bring them back again next week maybe. But <laughs> You know, we're looking forward to having Brother Josh and a couple other students with us uh, next week, and they're going to be ministering, so we're certainly looking forward to that. Um, and also also just remember, uh, as Sister uh, Rachel mentioned this morning, our community care program, and uh, just you'll be able to see at the back with respect to that. If you want to donate, we certainly do encourage you to do so. Amen. Let's stand together in the house of the Lord tonight. I do just want to open our service in prayer. I want God to have his way in this place tonight. Amen. Amen. I don't want to just go through the motions. You know, I don't want to just do, do the rote routine, but I want, I want to allow God to have his way. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And as we, as we open our service and prayer and worship, we do just want to have a couple needs we want to remember. Uh, let's, of course, continue to remember the Morrell family. Amen. That God will continue to strengthen and lift them up. Let's also remember uh, Luke Gallant and his wife and that little baby uh, who's, who's in the NICU uh, in Calgary. And also, uh, Sister Paula had mentioned if we could pray for Bethany. Uh, just a situation in her life she would like us to pray for. Uh, so let's just pray for that tonight. Amen. I'm sure there's many others here with a need just signified by an upraised hand. Amen. God knows tonight. Amen. Let's pray together in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for this great opportunity that we have to be in your presence. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your kindness and your grace, God, that we feel. We pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would just fill this place, God. We pray that you would have your way. Oh, God, I pray, take me, Lord Jesus. Get me out of the way, Lord. And, Lord, just let your glory, Jesus, fill this place. Let everything that's done be done for your glory. God, we surrender ourselves to you tonight, Jesus. We invite you, God, to have your way. We invite you, Lord Jesus, to fill this place. I pray in Jesus' name today, God, that the sweet spirit of God would move in and minister to each need, God. You know every need that's represented here tonight, God. Whatever it may be, you're able to move and to minister. I pray, God, above all else, Lord Jesus, that you'd reach somebody, God, that you'd save the lost. We pray in Jesus' name today. Intervene in every situation, God. We just want you to have your way, Lord Jesus. We give it all into your hands tonight, God, and we thank you in advance, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you're going to do. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house tonight. Night. Hallelujah. Jesus, you are good. Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So good to see everybody in the house of the Lord tonight. So good to have all our guests with us. We are so thankful that you are here. And we're just going to have a little bit of family time right now. I wonder if you'd step out of your seat, step across now, shake somebody's hand, tell them how good it is to see them in the house of the Lord tonight.
Psalms chapter 92, going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work, and I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Amen. Has, has he made anybody glad tonight? Amen. Praise God. I'm glad that he has made me glad. Yeah. Amen. Let's stand together in the house of the Lord as we enter into worship. Amen. Our worship team's going to come. Our wrestlers are going to come to expect our tithes and offering from our church family. If you're a guest with us, this service is our gift to you. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. a question the certain circumstances and things I could not understand so many times and trials the weakness blurs my vision and my frustration gets so out of hand oh but it's then I am reminded I've never been forsaken, and I've never had to stand one test alone. As I look at all the victory, the Spirit arises up in me, and it's through the fire my weakness is made strong. Because He never promised the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. But he never offered the victories without fighting as he said help would always come in time. Oh, just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says give in just to hold on my Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire again oh he never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. But he never offered the victories without fighting. As he said, help would always come in time. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says, just to show the Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire again. So many times I question the certain circumstances and things I could not understand. So many times trials, the weakness that blurred my vision, that's when my frustration gets so out of hand, oh, but it's then I am reminded, I've never been forsaken, and I've never had to stand one test alone, and as I look at all the victories, the Spirit arises up in me, and it's through the fire my weakness is made strong. Because He never promised that the cross would not get heavy, and the hill would not be hard to climb. Because He never offered the victories without fighting, and He said, help us. Always come in time. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision, and the adversary says, Give in. 
just hold on My Lord will show up And He will take you through the fire again Well, I know within myself that I will surely perish But if I trust the hand of God to shield the flames again Oh, He never promised That the cross would not get heavy And the hill would not be hard to climb He never offered victories without fighting Cause He said help would always come Oh, just remember when you said he in the valley of decision, in the adversary says, give in, just hold on, my Lord will show up, and he will take you through the fire again, but he never promised the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb but he never offered victories without fighting and he said help would always come and die remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary it says give in and just hold on Our Lord will show up And He will take you through the fire again He never promised The cross would not get heavy And the hill would not be hard to climb he never offered a victory without fighting. He said help would always come. Down. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision. Oh, and the adversary says give in. Just hold on. Our Lord will show up. And he will take you through the fire again. So hold on, Lord will show up. And he will take you through the fire again.
like the atmosphere in this house tonight. Amen? Amen. This feels like a victory atmosphere. And for that, I'm thankful because I was reflecting this week as I, uh, as God gave me my direction for this evening, and I was reflecting that, that sometimes God gives you something and it pours it into the vessel and then it smoothly uh, pours back out and it doesn't necessarily uh, tie you up in knots. It doesn't necessarily uh, keep you up late at night or wake you up early in the morning or, or consume your thoughts as you, maybe you, uh, you think during the day and take some time for the Lord. But this message is one of those that... Uh, that's on your shoulders and it's in your bones until it's preached and I, I'm thankful for the moving of the Holy Ghost because it's not important that I'm up here. It's important that God has a message tonight. And I think it would be appropriate if we just took a moment and gave him all the glory. Tonight. Gave him all the honor. Gave him all the credit. All the praise. Every ounce of credit that can be given ought to be given unto the Lord. For it's in Him we move, live, breathe, have our beat. It's all about Him tonight. It's all about Him tonight. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight to 2 Samuel 23. And verse number 11, just reading two verses tonight, verses 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel 23. And for a little bit of context, this scripture is part of a fairly long list of great deeds done by the mighty men of David. It's, uh, it's two somewhat inconspicuous verses when you consider all of the things that are on either side of it, you know, men slaying other mighty men and doing great acts of valor and, and, and winning glory for the Lord. But something leapt out at me about this story uh, last Sunday night, actually, as I was praying before uh, last Sunday night service. This, this just leapt out at me, and I grabbed my Bible, and I looked it up, and I found it. And, uh, and these words impacted me. It says, And after him was Shammah the son of Agi the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. Not the man, but the Lord wrought a great victory. Let's pray tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this house. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God you've blessed us, Lord God, with increase. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've blessed us, God, with harvest, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have blessed us, God, with your spirit tonight, God. And I pray that you would receive all of the glory, Lord Jesus. I abandon any credit, Lord God, that might be given me, Lord Jesus. I respectfully set aside, Lord God, any attention that might be given to me tonight, Lord Jesus, so that all the attention can go on to you, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that the heart of each and every person, God, myself most of all, would decrease tonight so that you may increase in our midst, God, and have your way and form us in your likeness and your image. In the name of Jesus, to you be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. I have a rendezvous with death. At some disputed barricade, it may be he shall take my hand and lead me into his dark land and close my eyes and quench my breath. I have a rendezvous with death, and I, to my pledged word, am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. It's a short excerpt pulled from a poem called, appropriately, Rendezvous with Death, written by Alan Seeger. And he didn't write it from a place of safety, and he didn't write it in peacetime. It was written in the trenches of the First World War, 
uh, in, its, in its opening stages when the fighting was, was especially brutal. And Alan Seeger lived day and night with the anticipation of battle, the, the expectation of difficulty, and the near certain chance of mortality. The First World War was destructive beyond belief. Even if we just look at the statistics, it staggers us backward. If we consider the cost in humanity and lives and souls, it's so much the greater. On August 22nd alone, the war started in, in, in roughly early August of 1914. August 22nd alone, the French lost 27,000 men killed in 24 hours. This was one of the darkest periods in human history. And Seeger, he was caught up in that experience. He was caught up in that war. His was a world of combat. His was a world of, 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 of mud and blood and stench and fear. World War I has been described as, as the war to end all wars. Unfortunately, that was not true. It's been called the blueprint for Armageddon, which may be a bit more accurate. It said that it destroyed the noble charisma of battle, this, this notion that, that every little boy should want to grow up and be a soldier. After World War I, that's not exactly how the public looked at it. And Alan Seeger lived in a time of gripping fear in those trenches. And he was an educated man, and he was, uh, he was a poet. And he wrote this poem, I think, not so much for the public, but for himself. Because this poem is his resolve not to run away, not to, not to shirk his duty, not to run away from the battle that he knows is coming for him. In the, in the full length of the poem, he, he describes the beauty of the oncoming spring with this sense of dread because spring is when the armies will mobilize again and when, and when ground will be attempted to be taken again, when, when advances will be made and the, and the great battles will be fought and when his life will be on the line. And so he describes and, and, and sort of contrasts the beauty of the spring against the horror of what spring means for him. And so in this time of waiting, World War I is sometimes described as, as, as periods of excruciating boredom punctuated by moments of absolute terror. And so as he's in these moments of, of excruciating boredom and, and yet grim anticipation, he writes this poem called Rendezvous with Death. And it's him saying that I'm not running away. I'm not turning back. When the officer blows the whistle, I'm going over the top of that barricade. I'm going into that flaming town. I'm going on to that battlefield because there are things in this life worth fighting for. I, to my pledged word, am true. I shall not fail that rendezvous. And he did not fail it. By all accounts, Seeger was a man who fought as well as anyone else, who went as bravely as anyone else, who overcame his fear as well as anyone else, and he paid the ultimate price. He was killed in action in 1915, in that, shortly following that spring that he feared so much. But it matters. It matters how Alan Seeger felt about fighting in that war. And it matters how this, this mighty man of David felt standing in the middle of a field of lentils, which to everybody else is an insignificant patch of ground, which to the outside appearance seems not to be something of such great significance that blood should be shed and that lives should be laid down for it. But there's something within this man Shama, that says, I have a battle to fight on this patch of ground. The odds are against me. Everyone else is running away, but I'm not moving. If I have a rendezvous with death, I will not fail that rendezvous. To me, this field is worth fighting for. And so he stood, and he fought, and he resisted, and he didn't love his own life so much that he wasn't willing to risk it. And he slew many Philistines. And again, the Lord, not the man holding the sword, but the Lord directing the man holding the sword, wrought a great 
victory. Because in every aspect of our walk with God, in every aspect of our day-to-day life, it's God that wins the victories. For every great moment in my life, I can look at it and say that God wrought that victory and not me, myself. If it had been up to me, I would not have measured up to the battle in front of me. I would have folded under the pressure. I would have broken under the strain. Or if if I had not failed that test, maybe I would have failed five tests down the road. Eventually, life would have been too much. But for the Lord. You see, Shama, he, he stood in the middle of the field and he swung the sword. But God gave the victory. Now, much like this man in his bean patch, we have an enemy. We have an enemy that's gathered together into a troop and is ready to come and to attack and to take what does not rightly belong to him and to, and to cause great hurt and discomfort and pain to the people of God if he can. We have an enemy, and he can win. That is something that can happen. He can win. He can destroy you. He may destroy your walk with God, but only if you let him. Only if you allow that enemy to take the ground that you're standing upon. James 4 and verse 6, and this is uh, really one of the great keys to success in life and in Scripture. James 4 and 6 says, But God giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And we have, I feel, a good definition of grace as as saying it is the favor of God because that's accurate. That's part of it. But it's not the entirety. And if you look throughout the epistles especially, the apostles use the word grace to mean something a little more than just God smiling upon you. Grace is not just favor, but it also refers to the empowerment of God in your life. It also refers to the ability given to you by God to withstand the evil day, to withstand the things that are against you. The New Living Translation translates that verse as saying, but he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. Verse 7, James says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. So in essence, James is saying, because God resists the proud, because God gives grace to the humble, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I probably heard the last sentence of that passage, quoted about 50 times more than the rest of that passage, Because resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's true. But it's not the entire picture. It's the the victory part without the process of victory. And and I understand that, that that was not the intention of men who quoted that portion alone. But we need to remember that there's more to it than just winning. Because we don't get the help if we don't have the humility. And this is something that, that when I first encountered it in prayer and in, and in study, it, it hit me because it's not the natural state of man. It's not the way of man to say, I need to get smaller so that God can get bigger. I need to decrease so that he may increase. It takes a special relationship with God to reach that point. It takes a certain frame of mind to reach that point where you can say, like John the Baptist, I'm about to get less famous because God is going to appear greater, because Jesus the Messiah is going to appear greater in the eyes of everybody that ever uh, adored me, everybody that ever clapped me on the back, everybody that ever said, good job, John the Baptist. They're about to go and follow my cousin. And that's what has to happen. And I will rejoice that God gets the glory instead of me. 
And that's so important because God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. There's a verse that, that we're quite familiar with, and maybe we, we misquoted a little bit, but we get, the, we get the two halves mixed up. But it says, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Why is that? Why, why is pride one of the necessary components to a, to a self-inflicted fall? It's because if you put your pride above everything else in your life, especially above God, then you won't call for help when you need it. You won't acknowledge the battle when it's on your doorstep. You won't see the problem until it's already in your village, until it's already taken the bean patch, so to speak, until it's already too late. Proud people have a lens over their eyes where they don't see life as it truly is. And they certainly don't see God as He truly is, and they certainly don't see themselves, unfortunately, as they truly are. And James is very pointed about this, and James is a very pointed speaker. He's not, uh, he's not a punch puller. He's not a, uh, he's not a kid glove sort of writer. And he says it very, very blatantly, that God resists the proud, and He gives grace to the humble, so submit yourself to God, and then He'll give the victory. We have an enemy that's relentless to our detriment, and unfortunately, we have an enemy that is not ignorable. We can't just pretend that he doesn't exist. We can't just pretend that he's not there. Many people go through life believing in God and heaven, but, but if you were to pry at them, they wouldn't confess that they believe in an enemy. And that's unfortunate. Because that's part of the picture. And problems you ignore get worse instead of going away. Things that you leave, they, they tend to get worse and worse. They tend to compound. They tend to build brick upon brick upon brick upon brick. They tend to take a step closer and closer and closer to the point of your destruction if you just ignore them. So for a very down-to-earth example, when I first moved out on my own, um, I didn't like doing the dishes, okay? I always had to help my mom uh, dry the dishes whenever I was a kid. And so, now that I'm an adult, and now that I'm out on my own, um, I sort of, <laughs> that, was, that was my form of rebellion, which is I would just inflict a, a giant pile of dishes on myself. So, you know, I'd use one plate, put it in the sink, use another plate, put it in the sink, use a bowl, put it in the sink. Right, so, so eventually the right half of my sink is just piled up with all these dishes. And when I'm eating rice out of a coffee mug with like a, one of those sporks, one of those plastic sporks you get at Thai Express because you don't, because I don't have any clean cutlery, then I would say, okay, I guess it's time to do dishes. <laughs> it's, it's dishes day <laughs> for this month. Um, and I would do them. And I would scrub, and I would sweat and be miserable, and, 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 and everything would be, would be dried and baked on there, and it would be uh, gross, and it would be a hassle, and it would take forever. And the great revelation that I've had as a, uh, as a personal housekeeper is that if you rinse the dish before you put it in the sink, most of the sticky stuff is gone already. And if you just do them at the end of each day, it takes five minutes and you're done. And that's it. You know, you, you, you suffer for five minutes, and it's over. But dishes are a problem that if I ignore them, they don't go away. Thankfully, I wouldn't have anything to eat off if, if they did. But the problem of my dirty dishes does not go away if I don't do anything about it. And um, they're just inanimate objects. That's just something that I have 100% control over. I mean, honestly, that's totally my decision whether or not that problem happens or not. Um, dishes are, are sort of a passive problem for me. Satan is an aggressive problem. He's not an inanimate object. He's not um, some sort of impersonal force. 
The Bible makes it very clear that he has a personality, that he has tendencies and traits and, and ways that he does things and, and, uh, and, and people that he, that he approves of and does not approve of. And Satan is, is, is crafty, but he's very, very aggressive by nature. And he'll come for that field of lentils eventually. He can't pass up the opportunity to destroy a blessing for very, very long. It's, uh, it's too tasty for him, if you will. And if, if you want to liken that to the Philistines who were gathered together into this troop, the, uh, the sort of ancestral enemy of Israel, gathered together to, uh, to make a little raid into Israeli territory, if, if Shammah doesn't stand and fight, then his village is, is done. It, it appear, he's, he's there alone. It only makes mention of him. So clearly it falls to him to be the one who stands up. The buck stops with him where he's at on that particular day. And if no one resists in the next village, the Philistines get to take more. If no one resists in the next village, the Philistines get to take even more and more and more. And if they come en masse, then Israel, if nobody ever fights back, they'll just become a, a slave state. They'll be conquered. They'll be utterly oppressed. They'll be enslaved. They'll be embittered. It's, uh, it's the Philistine modus operandi. We see David versus Goliath is, is basically the perf perfect example. If you look at the challenge of Goliath to the men of Israel, he says, he says, send me a man to fight. If I kill him, then you will be our servants. If he, if he kills me, we will be your servants. So the Philistines only conceive of things in slave and master uh, terms. Okay. The enemy is exactly the same way. He only looks at people as things to be enslaved. He has no love for them. He has no affection for them. He may enjoy what they're doing in a particular moment if he's, if he's brought them into some place of misery. But all he sees people as are things to hurt and things to bruise, and things to grind underfoot, and things to enslave. And slaves, all slaves do, all of their energy, all of the fight that's in them, just goes into surviving. And that's the most tragic thing about a slave, is that they're worn out day after day. They don't have their freedom. They don't have any freedom of choice, because there's so much oppression on them. And every bit of fight that they have in them just goes into staying alive. And that is not how I want to live. I don't want that to be my, my Christian experience. I don't want that. I don't want to come here and be oppressed and then go home and still be oppressed. I don't want to come here and be a slave and go home and still be a slave. Slaves fight to survive. Soldiers fight to win. Soldiers fight to take territory. Soldiers fight to defend their homes. Soldiers fight for something meaningful, something greater than just themselves. God is the difference maker. We can't do it ourselves out of pride. We can't say that, that I want to be a righteous man so bad that I'm going to be a righteous man just out of my own will. It doesn't work, and it never has, and it never will. God, in fact, he'll resist that. Because that's accruing glory unto yourself. That's, that's, that's chipping off a little piece of the glory that should be going to God and, and pocketing it for yourself. So you can say, oh, you know, look at, look at how much willpower I have. You know, that I managed to walk away from this lifestyle. Unfortunately, that doesn't last. It's not enough to be a good man. You have to be God's man. It's not enough to, to belong to yourself. You have to belong to God. And... We talked about Satan and how he enslaves people. And the difference between Satan and God is that Satan, when, when somebody comes to the adversary, he welcomes them with open arms, and he just keeps luring them backwards, luring them backwards, luring them backwards, saying, you know, just, just, just keep your eyes on the pleasure. Just keep your eyes on the sin. Keep your eyes on all the things that you are enjoying right now. And then he slams the door shut behind them, and they're slaves. Whenever you come to God, 
even if you've been away for a long time, even if you've never experienced the salvation of God. If you come to God and say, God, I want to be just your servant, because I've been a slave to somebody else long enough, I just want to be your servant, God says no. I want to make you my son. I want to make you my daughter. I want to put my cloak on you, and I want to and I want to put this, this ring on your finger that means that you belong to me as my child and not my slave, not, not somebody for me to abuse, but someone for me to love. But we don't get there in a place of pride. To, to keep talking about the prodigal son for a moment, he didn't, he didn't wake up in a palace and say, oh my goodness, I need to go home. He woke up in a pig pen and said, I need to go home. He didn't humble himself. Life did it for him because he tried to exalt himself and magnify himself. And when we abandon the desire and pursuit of personal pride and glory, when we stop taking the credit, period, even in our own hearts, God will show off what his glory is really like. And like I said earlier, that's, that's a hard one to swallow. It was for me. It certainly was for me. But in a place of humility, that's where God gives you your greatest power for the change you need in your life. That's where the grace comes. That's where both the favor and the ability to rise out of that situation comes when you reach a place of humility. It's a constant theme throughout the scripture. Humility brings God's favor. And uh, one of the slides that we use for prayer, and I'm, and I'm hastening on tonight, one of our slides that we use for prayer is Second Chronicles 7 and 14. It says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see how it goes. And it starts with humility. It starts out all the way down here, and it goes up, and it goes up, and it goes up, and it goes up. And that's the way that God works. When you willingly bring yourself to a place where you are all the way down here, and you're willing for God to lift you up, that's when it goes up and up and up. Because, you see, the people could have, in Second Chronicles, the, the people that God was speaking to, they could have stayed proud and prayed and sought his face. They could have even done their best to turn from their wicked ways. But God would not have heard from heaven. Because it starts with humbling yourself. And this message tonight is, is, is going, I feel God pulling it in a slightly different direction than maybe I thought it was going to be tonight. But I feel that that is, if you remember anything from from, from tonight, please remember that. That humility before God and submission to God opens every door in Scripture. Every door in Scripture begins with humility. Every door in Scripture begins with admitting, God, I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough willpower. I don't have, I don't have enough genius to do this on my own. And nowhere is that more true, to come back to the field of beans tonight for a quick moment, nowhere is that more true than fighting those battles in your spirit that you're going to face. Because the enemy, he attacks the mind, and the proud mind says that I can do this by myself. I can withstand the enemy by myself. I can, I can, I can stand up and I can, I can pick out the truth from the lies that the enemy's whispering into my mind, because he will speak both. The proud mind says that I can navigate this battle on my own. I can swing the sword well enough. I can fight hard enough. I can apply myself enough to win and to defeat these Philistines. And you know what happens then? The prayer stops. The study stops. Even the fellowship will start to dwindle. The things that we hold dear will go away in the face of that pride. And God will resist you 
as well as the devil. And that is the hard pill to swallow tonight. What that is, is a weak position that looks very, very strong, that on the outward looks very strong, but it's just, it's like a clay vase where it, it looks beautiful and it looks sturdy, but if you smash a rock into it, it's going to break and there's, no, there's nothing on the inside of that vase. It's a weak position that looks strong. But the humble mind, the humble soul, the contrite heart, as David said, says, I need God, and I want Him to receive the glory for bringing me out of this. And what comes then is much prayer and much study, because there's no, there's no fear then that you're going to encounter something that's going to correct you, that, that the Bible might point out that you're not perfect, because that's what you already know. You've accepted that. And that... That reliance on God is a strong position that looks weak. It might not look as though you are the king of the world to anyone else, but to God. He's got you inside of a fortress, behind ten walls, behind an army of angels, surrounded by His glory. It may not look like the greatest position on the outside, but it is the strongest place you can be is hidden. In God. In fact, it's, it's unassailable and no weapon formed against that sort of heart will prosper. Not the attacks of, of your fellow man, not the attacks of the enemy, not the weaknesses of your flesh. Nothing prevails against a heart that's completely and totally submitted to God. You want to know how to be spiritually unbreakable? Is to admit that I'm spiritually breakable. I can fail, but God doesn't. I can give up, but God never does. I can't pick myself up, but God can pick me up. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3 gives us our focus. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And here is the point tonight. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One of the biggest ways that you win is when you take control of your mind. Because the mind is the battleground of the saints and if you can control the battleground between you and the enemy, you decide which thoughts get to grow and fortify and become strongholds and which get weeded out. And it's difficult at first. But tying your shoes was difficult at first. Using a fork was difficult at first. The very basic aspects of your life were difficult at first. And it's not easy at first to take control of your mind. In fact, you're going to have to work at it intentionally, but it's possible. You probably tied your shoes today. You probably used a fork today. You probably got in a car and drove it, which is just incredible. If you stop and think about that, everything's difficult at first. But God gives more grace. Amen? Not for the little things in life like tying shoes, but for these important things like controlling the mind. And uh, when I was younger, I dealt with a lot of depression. I dealt with, with, with heavy, heavy uh, condemnation especially. And the revelation of that verse was to me the turning point, which is that, oh, I can choose whether or not I'm in this state of being. I can choose whether or not I'm under basically my own thumb and under the thumb of the enemy. I can make a choice right now. And, and I was in this haze of depression, and that was a total bolt from the blue for me because I realized that this is not going to be easy. I'm going to have to bring it into captivity. I'm going to have to go out and, and, and wrestle it, as Paul says, I'm going to have to go out there and make a great effort, but I can bring them into captivity, those thoughts that ought not to be there. Your mind belongs to you. And if your spirit is submitted to God's spirit, he'll give you the grace to say no to the thoughts that the enemy places in your mind and that the flesh produces that exalt themselves against God. Because the thoughts are not in captivity to me, they're in captivity to Christ. 
See, it's not so much that I have the power to take control over my own mind, and that's why, that's why in the world people say that, that, that things like this are totally unmanageable. But we know that we can bring thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I might be able to wrestle them, but I can't put them in jail, so to speak. But Christ has the power to take them. And so we must say for every victory, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. We sung a song that I think is very appropriate before I began to preach tonight, which is, give God the glory and He'll give you the victory. I could have just really not preached. I could have just sang the song again and you would understand what you understand now, but I am grateful for the Lord uh, leading us in that direction as a people tonight because, like I said, this has been churning in my spirit ever since I received it from the Lord. The Bible speaks of thoughts that then grow into intents and then they, they grow into actions. And if you stop sin at the first stage, it doesn't have to become an action. James 1 and 14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Temptation begins in humanity, and then the enemy piggybacks onto it and makes it worse. And so it's easy for him to defeat us when we make the mistake first. So how do we avoid that? We set boundaries. And again, I am I'm hastening tonight. We need to draw lines, not just lines in the sand that can be, can be kicked away or that can be washed away by a wave. We need, to, we need to carve lines into stone and into the rocks. I don't think it's an accident that God put the Ten Commandments on tables of stone rather than sheets or scrolls of paper. When you carve something into the rock, it's hard to get rid of. It's hard to move. We need to come up with fortified positions, positions that we can fight from. We need dil uh, diligence and vigilance in this last hour because the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he has the opportunity to devour. And that's our choice, whether he has the opportunity to devour us or not. So this is the other thing that I want you to remember tonight, and that is that don't set your line of, of conviction at the edge of sin. Chris, come here for a sec. I need you. So there, there's a human tendency to get as close to the edge of sin as you possibly can get without actually falling over and saying, this is where I'm going to set my conviction. So Chris is going light, to lightly push me off this edge that my heels are hanging on. That didn't take very much, did it? Now that's the precipice into sin. Now Chris is going to push me. He's playing the role of the enemy tonight. Thank you, Chris, for taking that upon yourself. He's, he's going to push me off the stage again. But here, I've... I've set my conviction here, and I've got my feet set, and my heels are dug in, and now Chris is going to push me into sin. Get it. <laughs> really? Come here. You see the difference? All it took the first time was this, and the second time, to even get me out of that set position, Chris had to really dig in and give it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, give him a hand. He deserves it. But you see the difference, how far he would have to push me and how long I have to break the grip and how long I have before I'm falling into sin to get down in the mud and fight back. Whereas before, it was the, it was the lightest push that sent me off the edge into sin. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of us and I, myself, in the past, included draw our lines. God said directly to Cain that sin lieth at the door, and it will take any opportunity. So we need to be setting those convictions in a strong place, in a place that's fortified, in a place that's well forward of where it needs to be. We can live life, and we can live life freely, but know this, 
that discipline in your walk with God is that road to freedom, the consistency of your prayer life and of your study. The strength of your convictions are the road to freedom. Ephesians 4 and 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. No place at all to the devil. Because it's not the biggest of big moments that matter the most. It's the thousand tiny victories that you win each and every day. It's the little choices that you make that are the correct choices for your eternal goal. Uh, college wrestlers call it the grind. Showing up every training day, every day that you're scheduled to train, you show up and you eat right and you, you drink lots of water and you avoid junk food and so on and so forth and you make a hundred decisions that might not be pleasant for the 30 seconds that you make that decision, but it's for the joy that's set before you. It's for the weight of glory that we're going to receive for the troubles of this present time. Now, we don't wrestle or fight or war against flesh and blood, but against the enemy of our souls. And once in a while, they'll try to take your head off in one go, but most of the time, they just inflict a thousand tiny little cuts at your discipline, at your walk with God, at your convictions. They're patient wolves, and they'll, and they'll nip at your heels a little bit at a time. They'll take one step over the line, and they'll stop, and they'll look at you. And they'll take one more half step, and they'll stop, and they'll look at you to see if you're going to do anything. And that lion's going to take one more step and stop and look at you and say to you, I'm over your line. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to act now that I've stepped across this boundary that you've set? What are you going to do now that I'm here and I'm inside your fence? The lines that we set, they have to be set firmly, clearly, and they have to be defended fanatically. We can't allow those little, you familiar with the term white lies? We can't allow things you might call white sins to damage us and to move our line back a little bit at a time, little millimeters moving back at a time. Samson, he led life the opposite way. He had few convictions. He had little regard for the things of God. He trusted himself far too much. The Bible says that he would shake himself when he was about to fight. But he only shook himself when his hair was already wound into her loom. He would only shake himself whenever Delilah had already wound him up in ropes and, and, and goodness knows what else. He only shook himself when he was about to be destroyed. And what the Lord wants for the church is not to wait until we're already trapped, and then to put forth some great surge of strength and wear ourselves out and tire ourselves out every single time that we've got to fight. God wants us to shake ourselves the second that that lion's paw goes across the line. The first encroachment of the enemy on our position has to be responded to. We can't allow our convictions to be chipped away at one millimeter at a time. We have to stand for the things that we've set clearly. That's why we set them clearly, because they cannot be violated, because they cannot be moved off of without a fight. So I ask you tonight, and I'm done. Sister Ward, if you want to come for the music, or, or whoever's playing the piano tonight, I didn't really take time to check. So I ask you tonight, having heard all this, to humble yourselves, to submit to God, then to resist the devil, and to bring your thoughts into captivity, and to set firm convictions far away from the point of destruction, because it's not just you and your soul that you're fighting for. When everybody else ran away, Shama stayed. He was probably a veteran already. He had probably already fought in battles. He was probably a middle-aged man by this point, or the Bible probably would have referred to him as a, as a young man. But Shamo, he wasn't with the rest of the army that day. He wasn't with the other uh, 29 mighty men. He wasn't with the, the thousands of the hosts of Israel and Judah. He was all alone because he was at home. 
He was far away from the, from the, from the fellowship of his brothers in arms. He was just there at home with him and his family in day-to-day -day life. And then the Philistines showed up at the border. And you have to think that he took the sword from the mantelpiece. He got the shield from out underneath the bed. He dusted off the armor. And he said in his heart, I am a tree planted by the rivers of water, and I shall not be moved. Not because he was fighting just for himself, but because he was fighting for his family. He was fighting for his people. He was fighting for that field of lentils. The enemy knows that if he can destroy you, he can weaken everybody else around you. He knows if he can get you to backslide, that's going to impact the faith of your family. He knows that if he can get you to fail, if he can get you to be so beaten down and defeated that that's going to dishearten other people. The enemy understands unity better than we do. That's why he's always trying to destroy it before we can catch on to it. You influence those around you. Your family, your friends, your church members, your co-workers. So you don't resist just for you, but for those around you. Why make a stand in a little place like a field of lentils in some insignificant village in Israel. It's not just for you. It's to protect that harvest. It's to protect the lives that might be if we win today. It's to protect the tomorrows of those people and the people that have not yet been born. If you could stand with me tonight. There was something in Shema's heart that said, if I don't resist, there's no harvest. If I don't hold this line, the enemy will take every last bit of my increase. If I don't fight, my family will die. I'll become a slave. The harvest will be taken. There'll be no food for us today and nothing for growth tomorrow. He knew that there are things worth fighting for. Your soul is worth fighting for. Your family is worth fighting for. The harvest, if it's the, if it's the bloodiest battle you've ever been in in the spirit, if you have to pray harder than you've ever prayed, if you have to study and refine yourself more than you ever have just to understand how to overcome this obstacle, you fight, you resist, you win for the people of the harvest, for those people that don't know the Lord yet, for the people that have not had this opportunity to hear the glorious gospel of Christ. You succeed. You walk uprightly for them. I wonder if we could just come to the altar tonight. Like I said, the Lord pulled this in a somewhat different direction tonight. And I just feel, rather than, than going ahead and, and picking a fight with the enemy tonight and, and warring a good warfare, and that's great, and we'll do that many, many, many times in the next few months, I'm sure. I believe that this church is going to take ground. I believe that it is going to win souls. I believe that it is going to have revival, but tonight, I just feel the Lord asking us to humble ourselves and say, God, when the increase comes, that it wasn't us that did this. I didn't witness well enough to anybody to save their soul. We didn't sing well enough to save anyone's soul. We didn't preach well enough to save anyone's soul. God, you did this. I humble myself before you and I give you all the glory. I just wonder if that would be our prayer tonight. Whatever we do, that we do it unto the Lord and not for our own glory. I understand that there may be a heaviness in this place, and that's okay, because this is a heavy matter. Let's pray together tonight. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for your word. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for the opportunity to serve you. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, that you have led us where you wanted to go tonight, Lord Jesus. And God, we just give you all of our attention tonight, God, all of our focus, Jesus, because you're worth it. Jesus. And we say, not unto us, O oh God, not unto us, but unto your name be the glory. Lord Jesus, we say, God, we humble ourselves. Lord Jesus, we decrease so that you may increase. God, we say, 
to you be all the glory, God, for we want none of it, Jesus. We desire none of it, Lord God, if it detracts one bit from you, Lord Jesus.